So, Ellen Langer, I'm delighted to um, be talking to you. This is the first time we meet. And uh, I wanted today to focus on one of your books, which is also, I think, one of your passions, which is creation, creativity, uh, art, but of course, art seen as a way of life. And um, I took a few notes from your book uh, just to trigger the conversation. I think there is a sort of a slogan in the book, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which is where we are is where we've never been. <laughs> yeah, I have um, another book of my paintings and one-liners that have been called from research over 40 years. And uh, that's one of the one-liners where we are for people to recognize that everything is constantly changing, everything is new, which means that everything is potentially exciting. Right. And that attention to the new is one of the ways you define mindfulness. Yeah, that um, in fact, uh, it's actively noticing new things. And when you actively notice new things that puts you in the present, makes you sensitive to context and perspective, and reveals to you that you don't know that thing you thought you knew as well as you thought you knew it. So then your attention would naturally go to it. And this act of noticing is the essence of engagement. So it feels good and all of that research shows that while you're doing this, the neurons are firing and it turns out that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. Right. And, and all the, the only other alternative is for us to deeply accept uh, that uncertainty is ubiquitous. You, we don't know anything. We think we know. In fact, I define mindlessness often as frequently in error, but rarely in doubt. And so if you know you don't know, then you naturally pay attention. But so many of us around the world have been brought up thinking that we do know. And so the way shake us loose from that is this act of noticing. When I give talks, Lewis, I, I enjoy asking people, I say, okay, how much is one in one? And then the board or they think I'm crazy, whatever it is, and dutifully they respond to. But then I inform them that no, one plus one is not always two. If you're adding one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. You're adding one watt of chewing gum to one watt of chewing gum, one plus one is one. In the real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two as often as it does. And if you are, most people are not aware that one in one, if they're learning it is two, if you're using a base 10 number system, if you are using a base two number system, one plus one is actually written as 10. So the, when somebody says to you, how much is one in one or almost any other question, the right answer is it depends. Right. And that's interesting because you are a professor, you're a professor of psychology. I'm a philosopher. And in what you just said there, I could see at least three echoes to, to the philosophical tradition, right? Of course, the obvious one is Socrates, who uh, uh, went in the streets and, and, and bothering people, telling them that they should admit <laughs> the that they, they don't know what they think they know. And actually, he, he, it cost him his life, right? Yeah. Perhaps less known is, I was thinking of the Situationists and Guy Debord in, in, in France in the 50s, uh, who were politically, were saying that it's actually even a, the beginning of a political liberation to be able to feel the freshness of every situation, right? Mm -hmm. And the third one with your one plus one, and you talk about them in your book, uh, are the surrealists, right? Mm -hmm. who, who were uh, very good at disrupting all the certainties that we may have about our present, which in their return to psychology, sometimes it seems that we could define consciousness as the attention to this that is not uh the the habit Previously right known. Yeah. right so given the fact that and sometimes people say it's strange because when we're kids time goes very slowly and then when we're adults it seems like time goes faster and faster 
And the other day I told my daughter, well, because when we old, we think we know, we recognize, and therefore we are sleeping all the time. And that's what you say, right? About it's mindless. Yeah, yeah that uh, the 40 years of research sadly has made clear to me that virtually all of us are mindless almost all the time. And the thing is that when we're mindless, we're not there. So we're not there to know we're not there. And so when people first hear me talk about mindlessness, they assume it's everybody else until they get some feedback on you know, simple things like you're driving on the highway and you want to get off at exit 20 and all of a sudden you look up and it's exit 28, you know, where was I? But it's much, much uh, more pervasive than that. And um, I you know, recently have been writing a lot about um, how I blame the schools around the world for most of this mindlessness because it's the schools that are teaching us one plus one is one. And it's the schools that are teaching us that I'm better than that other person. I mean, after all, I'm a full professor at Harvard, you know, rather than uh, a little song, this is gonna seem so silly to you, Lewis, but to me, it's so important. I wrote this little song, I can't carry a tune, so I, I probably won't sing it, ahead, but uh, for my uh, grandkids. And it's, everybody doesn't know something, but everybody knows something else. Everybody can't do something, but everyone can do something else. And that's the world that I'm trying to create with all of this writing, paintings, and, you know, and what have you. To take this vertical, you know, where everybody can be lined up uh, on some dimension, ignoring always who decided the criteria uh, and make it horizontal where everybody is respected. Right. And realize that the lives that most people lead and hurry through um, and they lead as if it's zero sum, you know, if you're the winner, that means I have to be a loser rather than uh, life is not zero mm. sum. Speaking of songs, if I, if I go scintillate, scintillate, diminished celestial body. <laughs> <laughs> Does that ring a bell? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a lot of things. That is a lot of what we do in academia, right? We 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 think we discover new things sometimes but we just make we just put fancy words in twinkle twinkle little yeah, star, little star right? and yeah. and then i'm just i'm not saying that for you but for the some of the people in the audience who might not yeah. but and, and and that's not really finding something new right it's just employing a discourse that is rewarded in a certain field and and creates a sort of a feeling of often yeah no, oftentimes that's the case, but, you know, so when I was writing um, or just started the work on mindfulness, um, it, it felt to me that it was just mundane creativity and that um, it, when you talk about creativity, there's too much attention on the product and this is attention to the process and that it made me think, and this is what you just uh, brought to mind, that if I um generate um einstein's theory of relativity so the world is not going to applaud me but for me it can be very um uh, creative and mindful so you've got you know both ends going you have the people who for whom it is brand new the people who like to think it's brand new but they're just putting new wine in old bottle or old wine in new bottles um and then the people where it doesn't matter whether the bottle is new or old, uh, whether the wine is new or old, but the way I'm tasting it makes it a brand new experience. No, that's very important. And I think that it's important to stance that when you're saying attention to the new, we're not talking about the, the last uh, Zara collection. Right. We're yeah. really talking about this, the fact that at every instant, the world is changing. When you take, when you see a time lapse video, right, you okay. see that. But and that again, is just just for our philosophical uh, followers, that there's a lot of whitehead there uh, and process philosophy. Yeah. Uh, Bergson, who said, uh, "I'm not just name dropping here because it's very beautiful for him." Uh, creation was first and foremost an emotion there, there is this emotion of attunement to the creative flow 
of, mm-hmm. of the universe and of, of the multiverse around us. And that's what you're talking about. Uh, yes, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. More or less? <laughs> more or less. And, uh, and so I, I'm going to go again. So uh, I, there's a sentence we talked about that. The more we know, the more blind we become. Uh, we become. Yeah, yeah become. that pe- people are oblivious to, um, to the, the fact of these changes. You know, so we just said everything is changing, yet our expectations hold things still. And then we confuse the stability of our mindsets, the stability of these expectations for what's actually happening. And so now you, since it seems in accordance with everything else you're saying, because Voltaire made clear, clearer in French than I'm going to in English, but that, uh, you know, you don't know it, it's all uncertain and uh, that's uncomfortable, um, but, you know, so be it. Now you mm. tell us how he actually said the, Right, the so I, I was, I was, uh, I was identified for the, uh, the French that I am, I thought I could disguise my accent, but, and, and so people might wonder, all right, okay, so how do you, how do you change? How do you become more aware? And there's a sentence that sort of gives the first clue. There are others, but you say, it's about going from reference to preference already. So you focus on what, what is intriguing for you, right? Is it start? Is it sort of a almost a cogito your mindfulness thing, right? Uh, the, the, I think that or I am, I am, I am mindful, therefore I am. Yeah, yeah. But the reference to preference was really about how the more we notice of something, the more we come to like it, okay. and so that it's so that. It's, the more mindful you are, the more not just open you are, but the more pleased you are with the world you're living. So okay. we did silly things like we took people who hated um, uh, um, heavy metal music and people who hated classical music and people who hated football. We had a lot of haters. We take all these activities, people who hate them. We have one group, just do it, listen, watch, whatever it was or notice one new thing about it. Another group noticed three new things. Another group noticed six new things. Doesn't matter what you're noticing, if it's smart, silly, but the more you notice, the more you like the thing that you're noticing. And so you and that thing somehow uh, form a a different kind of relationship. You're not separate from the world around Mm you. To go, to go back, because this is one of the things, and and I think this is consistent with uh, Socrates, that Behavior makes sense, this is a very important one liner. that behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective or else the actor wouldn't do it. And that when we recognize that, so instead of when you think, presuming you know why they're doing it from the context in which it's embedded, um, and you know, that if you actually ask yourself how to make sense out of that. So for instance, you may li- uh, not like me because I'm so gullible. Well, from my perspective, I'm trusting. I can't stand you, Lewis. I only know you a few minutes, but that's you're so inconsistent. But from your perspective, you're flexible. And it turns out that for every single negative characterization, there's an equally potent but oppositely balanced alternative. For every negative thing, there's a positive way of looking at it. And that then all of our relationships change. Uh, and our relationship to ourselves, uh, self changes. And, you know, that to be gullible, but would you like me to be less trusting? Probably not. Mm. You know, no, but I, I, I think that uh, that I almost hear some sort of um, a message of uh, perhaps not universal law, but some sort of a harmonization of relationships because uh indeed if i try to to step out of my uh ingrained uh dislikes i might start noticing and then i might if not fully appreciate i might understand why others appreciate yeah Yeah, i think that it's that um And we were talking before about thinking one and one is always two. So you don't think about it. You don't pay attention to it. You look down upon people who don't know that. Mm. 
this is the, the interpersonal version. Right. You know, that where we also have people set up as superior, you know, more or less superior to other people without recognizing the sense that their behavior makes in its own context. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that when you become more mindful and, and the way that I, uh, uh, who people will uh, take notice of, um, you be, and if you're, and less judgmental of yourself. And so that just opens up um, all sorts of uh, positive interactions. Mm. Okay, know, a first I... possible critique here, uh, and I'm sure you have a, a, a correct answer to it, but the paradox is like, okay, I become mindful and I start seeing that I could like everything. Isn't there a risk there, someone might say, of a sort of a dissolution of the self or a sort of you lose um, your own character? Um. Oh, gee, you know, I think that when you're a little kid and you don't have a clear sense of self and then you become socialized or whatever and you have a sense of yourself, uh, there's a higher order where you're just not concerned with yourself. Um, you know, concern with self to me suggests a, a, a lack of self-esteem. Um, when you really have high self-esteem, you're not esteeming, you're just being. So, um, so there. Okay, but uh, my question was also, and, and I see that it sort of connects with what you just said, sort of connects with the idea of flow, etc. But my question was also on the creative uh, side regarding to style, right? We often say that when an artist has style, uh, she... Uh, knows exactly what she wants to do and well, dislikes all sorts of other things. Yeah, you know, I remember um, when I started painting and somebody commented on my um, style. And at that point, I said, oh, I didn't know I had a style. <laughs> and I was very excited about it. <laughs> but if you were here, you came into my studio, you'd if you thought that having a specific way of doing something, you know, where you can tell, you know, this is a Picasso, this is a Mondrian, you know, whatever, um, you would either conclude that your thoughts about needing to have a specific style are wrong or I'm schizophrenic because, you know, the uh, it, it, what I do, it represents what I'm feeling at, you know, at the moment and my feelings are um, varied. And so the quote style will vary. And I don't know, I think, you know, that, um, I mean, Mon um, Monet was able to paint the same water lilies thousands of times, you know, and because he was mindfully paying change in the sunlight or, you know, or whatever it is. But I think to, uh, to keep that feeling of novelty uh, when you're doing the same thing over and over and over again is, is probably going to be hard for people. Mm. And um, I don't know, I, I think it's fun experimenting. Right. Uh, but I don't think there's, I don't think there's a right way. You know, the, the important thing is to recognize it almost doesn't matter what you do. What matters is the way you do it. And oh. if you do it mindfully as opposed to mindlessly, the ramifications, the advantages are, you know, are enormous. Right. No, and, and I think that uh, you speak of being authentic. And I think that's what I really appreciate in your practice of painting. Uh, and I encourage people to, to go at least see some images on online of, of your paintings, uh, is the idea that you don't need to really care about did my did, did does this painting right. resemble my previous painting right but that's also right. uh I, here i'm trying just not to agree all the time just to give to keep a little dynamic <laughs> right although i i do uh, tend to agree but someone would say oh yeah but that's because she's a professor and she paints on her spare time as opposed to a, a um a professional artist who needs some sort of like to brand herself. On the other side, we can say, look, when she's a professor, she only talks about mindfulness all the time. So she does have a style. <laughs> no, she doesn't. <laughs> That's cute. 
um, because I mean, mindfulness is a superordinate category. Right. That no matter what you're doing, as I said, you're doing it mindfully or mindfully. so it's hard to get away from it. Mm. Um, so yeah, so in some sense, yes. Uh, but um, putting that aside, I, I don't think that uh, that there's a right way of doing things. And um, you know, I, I tell this story in the On Becoming book. A friend of mine who drinks too much. And so she first saw the art and she was um, a fancy art collector, the African art. And um, so she saw one of my paintings early on. She goes, now there's something there, you know, there's something that I don't think in your Rembrandt. Okay. <laughs> you know, why should I think I'm Rembrandt? Mm. But um, I didn't say to her because I didn't think she would, she was in a state to hear it. And I wouldn't say it to most people because um, they might not understand what I mean by it, but, and Rembrandt isn't me. And that if I'm true to myself, right. no one can do me better. And I would rather be an original Ellen Langer than, uh, you know, a, a millionth um, Rembrandt, mm. um, you know, which is not denying the skill of right. uh, the great artists, you know, that have been uh, in existence. But mm. the, the, painting brings me great joy and so that's why I do it but I do it also as a psychologist which is that uh, something will happen and then I ask myself well did this just happen to me or is this have some more general truth to it mm. so an example um, and I think I talk about this in the Unbecoming becoming book I was painting and I accidentally dipped the paintbrush into the wrong color, whatever that means is ridiculous, right? But, and I look up and say, oh no. And I take a paper towel and I start rubbing it open, wiping it off. And I mean, these were cabinets in the background and it actually, to my eye, made it look better. Okay, so theory, psychology, which was, if you make a mistake, first of all, mistakes are good things because the only way you're not going, you know, if you make a mistake, that means you are mindless and you're better off becoming aware that you're mindful. Now, if you go forward, this becomes complicated, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. If you go forward rather than go back, it turns out that now you're, whatever you're doing, there is the imprint of that mindfulness. So we have, um, symphony orchestras, art, um, essays, you know, that we make people make a mistake, they go forward and incorporate that mistake and they end up with a superior product. Okay, so that led to a whole different theory of decision making, which is in brief. So the only way you can make a mistake is if you have a rigid plan. Right, because if you say, oh, sort of, and then you do something else, it's nothing, but it's when you say, this is what I'm gonna do. And to recognize that that plan was just a decision moments before. And for it to be a decision means there was uncertainty. Now, what happens with us, we make decisions and then we freeze and act as if, you know, this is the only answer. Forgetting that just recently, we had no idea what you know what we wanted, what the answer was going to be. Anyway, so the the short of this long story is that I go back and forth between painting and then writing and doing my research. Um, and uh, you know, it's fun. I mean, my first painting um, was on a shingle, and it was a woman on a horse, in, to my mind, racing through the woods. And I thought afterwards, wow. Was she in the woods because I was painting on wood? <laughs> Normal people don't ask mm. themselves these sorts of questions, mm. but um, uh, I had another painting where of uh, this alcove I have in my house in the cave, and um, I'm there, and uh, my dearest friend is there, and she is reading, and I'm leaning forward uh, with the book in my lap rather than reading. And I was I had no idea that this is what I was painting when I started. And that was the reality of the relationship where I'm trying to get her attention. So what was interesting to me is I you know, think I'm painting us in the chairs reading. And then I'm just totally lost, engaged in what I'm doing. And then afterwards, it's, it tells me a whole other story. 
you know, some of the things that mattered to me that I didn't realize at the moment. Anyway, it's fun. Yes, and, and I mean, in the book, I see that you have some sort of a experimental curiosity, even psychological curiosity when you paint, such, for example, that when your colleague told you that the, I think it was the legs or some piece of furniture yeah. that <laughs> didn't look right, and yeah. then you you corrected it, but then you you realize no, actually, from a certain it's perspective, more interesting. Yeah. that was yeah. right, right? And you do right, reconsider the mistake and dec decide to take advantage of it. Yeah, you know, and, but when you start the game, or for me, when I started, since I had no formal training, and, you know, your listeners should know that, um, yeah, this is intuitive art, we'll say, self-taught, um, you know, different, much of what you'd see in a museum. Mm. But, so I um, I didn't know uh, uh, the painting of the dogs playing poker. And so I painted my own dogs and people playing poker, oblivious to, to that painting. Or you and thought you didn't know it. Then, uh, yeah, no, I really didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, who knows? Deep in the recesses, I might have seen it. But at, at any rate, my table was floating in the air. You know? um, and when I realized that, then I thought, oh, so I painted it again, grounding the table, you know, making it look more like you know, a table in a room with people sitting around it and dogs sitting around it. And it, it wasn't interesting any longer. And so that happened a lot when someone would tell me, uh, because I, I would seek out um, advice from people to get a sense of you know, what I was doing. Like I had this, um, uh, young boy bringing groceries to uh, this woman sitting on a bench. That was you know, what was in my mind. Now, she was close, he was far. He was very large, she was small. So a friend said, that can't be, the perspective is all wrong. And I thought, oh yeah, but that's because the fact of him bringing the groceries is the main event. Hmm. You know, and so then I changed it and then I changed it back. I said, no, the, you know, the other is nicer. Right. Um, I right. had, you know, I, uh, one of my friends who's a very good artist says, why do you listen to people? <laughs> you know, hmm. I don't know. Right. I mean, that's what I do for a living, I guess. Exactly. And, and so, but there's a lot there. So I'm just trying to, I'm not going to monopolize the, the, the speech here, but so on decision making, uh, it's uh, even worse because now people are, letting AI supposedly make the decision, right? Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, another philosopher, French, would say that's just bad faith. They are actually making the decision, but they don't want to take responsibility for, for the decision. Yeah, because you, you have to always decide whether to accept that person's decision. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so you like, you, you're saying that mindfulness is also about uh making choices being less reactive i didn't think that this talk was going to be about connecting mindfulness to philosophers but nietzsche is pretty big on saying <laughs> reacting is really bad you need to act and so you're right yeah. when we make more choices we're less reactive yeah but as far i mean just and we don't have time now, but maybe in the future, but I've written a lot about this in other places, not in the Unbecoming book. Um, my decision theory, the mindful decision theory can be summarized, or the bottom line to it is, rather than spend time trying to make the right decision, we should make the decision right. So if we can work back to Sartre and everybody else. Um, right. uh, it doesn't matter what the option is because you're always deciding yeah. Uh, about something unknown in the future and most people live their lives as if the future is going to be a replication of the past mm. which you know typically it's not so we always use yesterday's solutions to solve today's problems right. mindfulness preaches a, a different way of being mm. and that's a real problem because uh, so i i uh, i do a little bit of philosophical health uh, counseling with a multinational called Vattenfall, uh, who mm -hmm. produces energy in, in Europe, uh, mostly in Sweden, and there are a lot of engineers. And, and, uh, but some of them are, are, are really aware of, of their sort of uh, biases, 
And one of those biases is precisely to try to gather as much data as possible before we take a decision. And of course, yeah. what happens is that they never take a decision or if they take a decision, it's actually sometimes not even yeah. uh, related to the data. Well, so here's a way to argue with him or uh, to not only is there no endpoint to the amount of information you could consider, relevant information, but it's also the case that each piece of information can be understood in multiple ways. And so even if we take what I said before about, um, you know, are you, uh, am I gullible or uh, trusting? Now, if you want to make a decision, should we be friends? It's very easy when you're adding things up, if you see me as trusting, then you say, okay, we should be friends. But what if you see me as trusting and gullible? Well, then it cancels out. And so with every uh, potential consequence, it, you have the exact same thing, that there's a way that consequence is good, bad, or indifferent. It all depends on how you understand it. So you can't add up costs and benefits to figure out what to do. Mm. And that's okay. Um, again, flip a coin, use some, um, uh, I don't know, you know, you can say that you can make the decision, the, the second option that occurs to you, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm. Um, and, and I suggest then make it right. Right. There's people, you see, decision making, oh, I'll keep quiet, but you got me all excited now. Uh, I'm, I'm getting excited too, but let's let you finish. That, is, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, this is another biggie but that prediction is an illusion. And so and all decision-making relies on the presumption that you can predict. Because if you can't predict, then what are you, what are you deciding? Mm -hmm. So I do this little thing in my advanced decision-making class at Harvard, and I'll say to people, okay, I have been teaching a version of this class for 40 years. I've never missed a class. What is the likelihood I'm going to be here next week? And we go around the room, and these are Harvard students, so they won't say 100%, say silly things like 97%, as if there's some calculation they did. But so essentially they all say 100%. Now I say, okay, let's go around again, but this time I want each of you to give me a good reason why I might not be here. Always the first person says, well, you've always been here, you deserve the time off. The next person says, your car got a flat tire. The next person said, your dog had to go to the vet. We get 12 depending on how many people in the room, 12 to 16 good reasons. Then I say, okay, what is the likelihood I'm going to be here next week? And now the 100% drops to 50%. So people are wonderful after the fact, making sense of what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Going forward, it's, um, there are too many possibilities. Right. And so, so if you can predict, and I need more time to persuade you fully of that. But if you can't predict, then decision making makes no sense. Mm. But so. here there's a very interesting because um, I was I, I, I was willing to ask you a question five minutes ago. And in fact, it's sort of the same than I want to ask you now. Five minutes ago, you said. Uh, it doesn't matter the critiques because I'm I'm just trying to do I I'm be, I'm not even trying. Well, You're going to say I'm not trying. I'm I'm being Ellen Langer when I paint. So there's a notion of identity here that I want you to hold. And then you were saying you were talking about decision decision making. And so the first question was, but if it's a little bit the same idea of the dissolution of, of identity. It might not be the self, but this idea that if you're authentic, does, doesn't that mean that you're sort of on a, on a pathway of unveiling who Ellen Langer is genuinely? That's the first question. If you can hold okay, it, yes, connect it to the okay. second. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can stop here if it's too long. <laughs> you want to answer that one, and then I'll 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 keep the uh, the second. Good question. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to give me the second one. Yeah. So the second is, in the Middle Ages, the French aristocracy invented this idea of the motto, right? Uh, and so it was this idea that spread around the world that 
if you had a, a, a motto that expressed your mission on earth, uh, like uh, for example, Jeanne d'Arc was uh, in the name of the king in the sky, which was very powerful for her because then she could talk to kings in uh, on earth right. at equal level. So that motto helped uh, people maintain a sense of their uh, uh, vision mission on earth, which, which they repeated daily, not to close themselves to, to what could happen around them, but sort of to filter their awareness. So it's a sort of dialectics there of being me, Ellen Langer, and at the same time, because I'm trying to be me, I can I can perhaps be more aware to new things. Or am I? Yeah, well? that, yes, no, that no, that's all very interesting. I think that um, the me that you're talking about is something from the outside looking at me. The as the actor of the actions, I'm not trying to be anything. You know, I'm just being. And that um, certainly if I'm, oh, we can take silly examples that, you know, you have your favorite stories and every time you meet someone new, you tell your favorite stories. So that's something that you're doing that other people aren't doing, not the same stories. So that can make it look like there's a you. Um, but I, I really think as I said before about these three levels, and, and in general, this is the way I think about the world. Um, we'll start in three levels of sophistication. It's not really about sophistication. But the first level, so let's take, um, you see some, an old person drops their cane. So what do you do? Um, you're a bore, you don't know anything, level one. Level two, you rush in to pick up the cane to help her. Level three, you don't do anything. You watch because she's going to feel better if she picks up the cane herself. So level one and three are not doing anything, but they're so different. You know, so you have little kids, a different example. Little kids are uninhibited. They haven't learned the rules. Level two, almost everybody we know is inhibited. Level three, hopefully you get to the point in life uh, where you become disinhibited. Now, lots of these older folk, I'm a part of this group. Um, it's not that they don't know the rules. It's that they no longer care about the rules. Mm. And so being disinhibited can look like uninhibited. But again, it's for a you know, whole different reason. We can take all your famous um, uh, philosophers that you've talked about, and we can have level one, people who don't know who they are, haven't read. Level two, people who become obsessed with their work. Level three, people who say, you know that if I allow myself a certain way of being in this world, I'll come to all of the information myself. Mm. So they're, they're both attending to exactly who said what, uh, but again, very different. And the problem in this world, as I see it, one of the problems is that there are a few people at this level three and that people at level two see them and missee them as level one, right. rather than as a way to, to you know, move beyond. Um, but, you know, so part of this, you know, when you're young, you don't have a style to go back to what you're saying before, you don't know the rules. Um, level two, now you're playing by the game, playing it well or not well. And that when you get beyond that, I think that, it's just, it's just all open territory, you know, right. so you can go and you can paint if you want to stick with that, you know, in oils, um, and uh, you can be very realistic, and then you can turn around and do something very abstract, which, you know, Picasso did, um, and so on, so it's certainly mm. not unheard of to, to change styles, but, right. um, but young people, uh, you could tell you this, I really understand this idea of, uh, you know, genuine original, some sort of liberation, but I'm too afraid because I'm young, right? Is it something that comes when you have a certain age where you, you know, you, you know that you have some form of security or uh, 
is it possible? I'm going to make a confession. I think I'm too creative. And that, that put me in a lot of trouble when I was young because I, I had a hard time just giving the expected standard because I could do it. And, and, but in some situations in life, you do need to, to, to deliver that normality. Uh, and it's you, sometimes you know, hard. But, but you, yeah, but you make the choice. And that's what you weren't doing as a kid. You know, you can say this is a situation where, well, I'm going to you know, uh, draw within the box or whatever the, the margins, um, or I don't care. Um, you know, nothing forces you if you can see things that other people don't see. In other words, someone says to me, how much is one in one? In many circumstances, I'll probably just say two. Hmm. But that doesn't mean you know, that I don't know that there are many circumstances where that's not true. And um, I think that you felt uh, squashed, suffocated because of the, the schools. And that's what I said, you know, originally that schools are suffocating more so than educating uh, right. students all over the world. So um, I, you know, I tell this story, I've told it so many times, it, I don't have a feeling of its truth anymore. Uh, whether this is how I learned this or not, but I was at this um, horse event and this man asked me, could I watch his horse because he was going to go get his horse a hot dog? You know, well, I'm Harvard, Yale all the way through. Nobody knows better, some as well, but nobody knows better that horses are herbivorous. They don't eat meat. Good. Sure, I'll watch your horse. He goes, he comes back with a hot dog and the horse ate it. And everything changed, everything, you know? And so um, uh, you can follow the rules and be aware that they may be silly. Uh, if they're harmful to you or somebody else, I say, don't follow the rules, which is what you did with your career and you seem to be doing just fine. Mm -hmm. um, rather than give up your, your soul to, to people whose rules are Visions that were based on an earlier time that might have made sense in some circumstances and clearly didn't in others. Right. So, you know, I don't say break the rules. Uh, what I say is whose rules are they? And I use this example in one of my, in my health class where I, I make clear, you know, you have insurance companies have to decide uh, what is a drug, you know, whether they're going to reimburse you for the drug. And so that means how serious is the disorder or disease? Um, and, you know, so you have to have people make this decision. So let's say the drug is Viagra and the people on this committee making this decision at the insurance company are all 50 year old men versus um, all nuns. My guess is if they're nuns, they're going to be less inclined, you know, to pay for the Viagra than if they're lusty 50 year old men. And the point is there's always somebody behind it who's made the rule. Mm -hmm. And when you reveal that, it gives you much more latitude, you know, that for everything that is, was at one point a decision. And for it to be a decision, as I said, that means there was uncertainty. And if there was uncertainty, it means there are alternative ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So every time something doesn't work, I say, change it. Mm -hmm. Um, no, it, indeed. So your, no. We could say you are you are a dangerous politician disguised as a respectable yeah. Harvard professor. Yeah, yeah. But but the, this, this, <laughs> these advices are, and of course, people, you write in your book, for example, uh, and that's André Gide, the, the, the French writer, you write one, uh, quoting him, one does not discover new lands Until without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long time right so it does right. sound a bit risky and, right well oh, for sure but it's that or living a life where you're painting by numbers mm. you know which um so to me uh it's an it's an easy decision right no i'm glad that you mentioned numbers because i have a slight problem, and I would like to collaborate with them. I have a slight problem with psychologists. They, a lot of them seem to be what I, what I call arithmomaniac, right? <laughs> they want to crunch numbers. They want to, you know, questionnaires. 
how do you combine as a psychologist you you had to also do some quantitative thinking sure right sure but you you know you always stay in charge the numbers don't rule hmm. and that um you know that if it's garbage in it's garbage out uh when you're doing things like you know that's what they say about factor analysis you know you get all these things what are the four or five things that are really going on here um i think that much much of what i do actually is is very different when i didn't discover this early on i thought i'm doing the same kind of studies everybody else is and then i realized that much of the research that's done is descriptive it's trying to tell you what's happening now and much of my work is trying to see uh how we can be better how it can be different you know so that's how i i came to the counterclockwise study mm. this is where we retrofitted a retreat to 20 years earlier had old men live there as if they were their younger selves and without medical intervention we got improvement in hearing vision strength memory and they looked noticeably younger and you know you wouldn't use those measures if you didn't think that you were going to affect that sort of a change mm. um even the earliest uh, nursing home study where we gave people choices and plans and found out that they live you know were living longer um uh, they they all have the same sort of flavor and we have uh, some fun studies now we have um i probably shouldn't mention it but i will i can't give you any information about it because we don't have the data yet but we're and the counterclockwise was to take people back in time so now we're taking people at different ages young people forward in time because i believe people are capable of doing far more than they think they can do and in in fact we've done that i i would say to people do as many of whatever and they do it um and then i take another group of people and i'd ask them to do twice as many as those and they would do it and you know and so on yeah. um we have a theory of fatigue which is that you get tired around 2/3 into a task so we have people do um push-ups when well, we'll, we'll have new jumping jacks it's easier and we'll do 100 jumping jacks you tell me when you're tired why well, you get tired around 67 I have another group of people going do 200 jumping jacks when do they get tired around 138 or whatever twice a week mm. um and um so i can i'm pushing the envelope but i believe right. fatigue satiation virtually everything is a function of the way we think of it right so it's and, mind over it's the double edged mind over body uh because well, it's not even mind over negative. body Yeah hmm. no no but because my theory is mind and body are one right and therefore wherever you put the mind you're necessarily putting the body so we have lots of studies where we put the mind in strange places and take our measurements and um you know that uh people have been have been worried uh psychologists uh researchers oops did i just lose you no you just uh There it's just more light <laughs> okay. it was uh, um, an enlightened right. i'm going to say something profound that's why i need to add the light but what was i saying oh yes that um researchers in the past couldn't explore the extent to which we can control um our health because they were always looking for the mediating mechanism meaning how do you get from this thing a thought this fuzzy thing to something material called the body And so that problem um has kept things at bay. I say these are just words mind body who cares let's put them together where you put the mind you're putting the body and we've done really um very um, unusual sorts of experiments all starting with that counterclockwise study which we've replicated all over the world not all over but in many countries in the world. So it's right, and it's a very uh, favorite. There, there was supposed at some point to even to be a movie with Jennifer Aniston, it's right? Aniston and Flame, yeah. But it turns out, you know, so the other day somebody referred to it as a very famous study and I thought, okay, well, I guess it is a famous study and the reason I can say that is that if you watch the Simpsons, the Simpsons go to Havana. Um they actually talk about the study. So 
Right. So we didn't no, get did. we didn't get the Jennifer Aniston movie, but uh, you got the Simpsons, which Simpsons. is more iconic. <laughs> Maybe. But I like the idea of of uh, uh, unity, which is very Spinozian. Sorry, not not. I last, was waiting. You know, last, but Lewis, last... Lewis, I must tell you. As right. you were going through all of them, I right. was waiting for Spinoza. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and and Tell so and, why. Mm. and and it's interesting because Spinoza had this idea also that uh, the core emotion from which all others derive is joy, and in a way, this you you this is what you write in all your books, right? Yeah. The, the joie de vivre. Yeah. And that's a sort of little pause because we 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 all aspire um, to that, but there is uh, and and now I lost myself. See, I got I got mindless <laughs> mindless in in this idea of joy. Uh, but you you speak about Renaissance, which is connect close to that uh, joy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to so my you you start you research mindfulness. I research what I call philosophical health, which I'm discovering are quite close. And it's the idea also that we would like to have a certain uh, uh, echo, coherence, uh, harmony between our values, our our sort of the way we interpret the world, our worldview, whatever that means, and the way we act. And very often uh, when I do my consultations, I see that we tend to hold beliefs that are contradictory and therefore we act in the world in in contradictory ways which means which sort of relates to your idea that if we simply pay attention right uh, we will perhaps make not, not make less mistakes because we said we said mistakes are important but at least we'll make our own mistakes, right? The ones that that nourish our de- personal destiny. Well, and I said that if we're mindful, we won't make mistakes because there we don't have a rigid plan from which we, you know, we would deviate and result in a mistake. So right. there's no rigidity in the first place. There's no mistake in the second. Hmm. But um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, philosophical health is is interesting. I think that for most of the people, that they're it's philosophy at a, at a whole different level. I think that sometimes people are asking what is the meaning of life, but most of the time uh, it's um, you know they're just negating their their daily lives. Hmm. And I think that when you say um, that they're they're behaving in, in ways that are inconsistent. Um, uh, you know that uh, uh, what was what is it? Um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. We'll bring Hegel in. You know <laughs> that these these things. There's a higher order that brings them all together. Mm. You know that I don't uh, I don't know I, it. It doesn't feel right, but I can't think of many instances mm. one way or the other, whether people walking around feeling that they, they're they behaving in ways, di- I, yes, okay. People do behave in ways different from the way they wish they would behave. They wish, oh, I wish I didn't say that. Oh, I wish I didn't smoke that cigarette. Oh, you know, I wish I was able to return your email. Yeah, so they're, they're not doing what they think they should do for me. I would uh, counsel them and tell them that, again, behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective or else the actor wouldn't do it. It made sense to you to Mm. do whatever it is Mm. in that situation. Right. And um, yeah, so I I thought, Lewis, that Mm. that was going to lead to some profundity. I apologize. No, but I I appreciate the rhetorical move (laughs) in taking the most dogmatic of philosophers, Hegel, to... (laughs) to uh, sort of disqualify <laughs> philosophical <laughs> health. Uh, I think that actually this is a very good example because, so Hegel, it's all about dialectics, right? This, this idea, mm-hmm. thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I rather speak of creolectics, which where introduces the multiplicity 
And in fact, I, I don't speak of synthesis, I rather speak of anthesis, which is the blossoming of, of, uh -huh. of flower. So I, I, I do agree that it's not about making people into these sort of rational machines that, that we cannot be, right? Mm -hmm. It's that in our everyday life, sometimes we all, um, like I had this example about this Russian guy, he couldn't understand why at 55, he didn't, he didn't have a, a love of his life and he didn't have a child. Uh, and I spoke a little bit with him about his, you know, the, the, the perceptions of women, et cetera, et cetera. And on the one hand, so he wanted love, which is an idealist position, right? Mm -hmm. But when he spoke of women, he, he thought that they the way to, to get one is to either through <laughs> money, buy uh, having a nice suit. <laughs> so he was holding both an idealist yeah. position and yeah. a nihilistic one. And, and yeah. so those things are interesting. Are, are interesting. But I think we, we are arriving because we've been talking one hour and I've been meaning to, to ask you a question, which, which for me is like, perhaps like going too much into like sort of it, maybe it's meta mindfulness it's yeah if if you were to to say now and hopefully you're not your last words the <laughs> final sentence of your life what would it be well i think i probably would repeat some version of what i've already said um that um the, the way to be in this world, I believe, is to be confident and uncertain. And that will lead you to be mindful. Uh, for too many people, their confidence rests on certainty that's simply wrong. You know, so that's a frequently in error, but rarely in doubt. And that people need not be afraid. Uh, let, let's, let me end with this other that we can understand our uncertainty in two different ways. And for most people, you know, I know that I don't know, you're acting like you know, therefore I'll pretend and just hope I don't get caught. Um, so that's a personal attribution for uncertainty. What I'm suggesting is people ignore that and they make a universal attribution for uncertainty, which is, I don't know, you don't know, nobody knows. And then we can stand tall and be confident and then find out. But the finding out isn't finding out in any absolute sense because again, everything is always changing, which makes everything continuously exciting. But now you make me think of something else that we could have covered for people, which is that for people to recognize, um, this is Epictetus, that stress, it's the view you take of the event. Events are nothing, consequences don't come pre-packaged. And so you can see any of them as positive, negative, or neutral. When you recognize that you have this control over the way you're going to experience whatever happens, then uh, not knowing is, is not scary. You know, oh my God, what are you gonna say? Will I be able to answer? Just say, sorry, I don't know. Confidently, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the the point is that um, all of our interactions with other people at work and with ourselves change when we recognize that we don't know. The fun is in trying to find out, and that you don't know either. And um, and I can make the world um, whatever I want it to be. For every negative, there's an equally potent but oppositely balanced positive alternative. So for me, Lewis, if we get off now, that's good. I'll go and I'll paint. If we stay on now, that's good. I'm enjoying talking to you. Whatever happens is mm. good. No, but I like to... no. Sorry. Uh, no. I like the message of learning because I think that's what you're saying also. It's like if if I'm able to tell myself. I actually know less than I think I know. I can start learning some something new. That's one thing. And the other thing, because people might be uh, willing to get some sort of a, sort of a life advices, or we didn't speak too much about that. But 
improvisation seems to be uh, an important, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but. No, no, uh, surely. But, but I think that there's a lot of it. But in fact, you know, um, when you said you wanted to talk about the Unbecoming book, there's a, a quick fun story with that. Um, I had sent the book to the publishers, Random House, as Mindful Creativity. They sent it back with the title, I'm Becoming an Artist. It was so new in my painting career that I loved being called an artist. It was silly. But the, the book is really about interpersonal mindfulness right. and has, it has all the advice. So, um, yeah, so the, the idea is no matter what you're doing, be there to do it. And that means actively notice. And that keeps you happy, healthy, engaged, mm -hmm. active. And we have lots of data that the paintings you paint, the products you produce, all bear the imprint of that mindfulness. So they all end up better. So in other words, by not paying attention to how good they are, just doing them fully and enjoying them, they end up better. Can't beat that. Mm. And I, I don't want to hold you more because if, if you said that you were going to be painting, <laughs> uh, it's probably a little bit more interesting uh, than no, our no, very I enjoyed this. <laughs> and this was like a philosophy course. I hadn't thought about many of these people for a long time. So I'm there, really there could be a, a book there. Um, you know, a mindfulness and and the philosophers. Uh, let's talk about that uh, some other day. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that would be great. Okay. Anyway, so, this was fun. Yes. Yeah, so really, thank you very much. Um, Usually, so I can end the conversation uh, here unless you have a comment, say anything you would like to add. No, I feel, I mean, it's up to you. you know, okay. I, Go ahead. It was good. No, I have nothing else to say. Okay. okay. No, thank you. It was great. Fantastic. All right. Good to see you. And, and we'll talk about that book. That could yes, be fun. Let's, let's keep in touch and, and do that book. We can announce. Yeah. Now we need to find the title. And um, and then that's fifty percent of the work. Uh, you know, I was a publisher in Paris oh, yeah? for many years, and uh, I loved the, the the game of finding uh, titles because yeah, very often if you find a good title that sort of guides you uh, at least to you know like your exercise people to. So what do you what do you think of this? Okay, so I have two titles. The title like this for my new book that I sold to Random House. Um, this is what they bought, which is why not? And this is psychology of possibility. Right. The other, which people love or they hate, is unimpossible. So to create a new I, word. Yeah, I think that the conservative, more expected title is why, why not. not? Okay. Right. Yeah, okay. And there's the there's the book of why, which is a big hit in uh, AI. Um, mm -hmm unimpossible it's it's less expected uh, so um let me think about it but yeah i think i think i have a preference for for an why impossible. not no, for an impossible. Un yeah. oh really yeah because oh, that's because, i told you before that, that i was I too to creative it's too strange right and, and, and my book I don't to, sell so <laughs> <laughs> i have to fight with the publishers if i use that one so okay so if it's not a you know a slam dunk yeah. I'll, I'll probably end up with why not. But that's and a I'll very call one of the chapters on impossible. That's why a very good conclusion because how, how I found you, yeah. uh, uh, and how I just a few days ago I, I, I heard about you before, but how I really decided to let's let's have a chat yeah. is because I googled psychology of the impossible uh, of the possible. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I've been writing uh, two articles for, there's a, an encyclopedia coming. It's called the Palgrave Encyclopedia of the Possible. Oh, really? Right. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I wrote in there about creolectical intelligence and philosophical mm. health. And they have, I'll, I'll send you the link. They have a lot of interesting stuff and not only psychologists, but philosophers, et cetera. So I, I think that the, the concept of the possible is, is, is coming back. So it's a great yeah. subtitle is great. Maybe that's the title, the psychology. Well, of the no, possible. I use that, you know, I used um, the counterclockwise, the psychology of possibility. Right. And so this will be why not the psychology of possibility or 
unimpossible, the psychology of possibility. Mm. That doesn't flow as you No, know. because you repeat two times. Okay. Possibly. Let me yeah. think about that and, uh, think and, about it. and about also our book, uh, um, my, uh, The Mindful Cogito. That's a bad title. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, thank my you pleasure. very much. My pleasure. You stay and, well. And let's stay in touch. Thank you. Bye.